uh, explanatory inference seminar. So today is my pleasure to introduce you Francesco Jenko. Uh, he's a postdoc in the IHPST uh, Institute of History and Philosophy of Science and Techniques in Paris, one. Uh, and he's working on a project uh, with uh, Francesca Potolesi on project insights from Bolzano. He, uh, so his work is quite uh, relevant and very connected to our own project. And in particular, we are very interested in a paper he wrote uh, together with Francesca Potolesi and Lorenzo Rossi. And uh, that about what he's going to talk today. Uh, so yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you very much for the invitation to the organizers of the seminar. Uh, it's, it's very nice to be here in person as well, which is not uh, so common lately. Uh, it's a great pleasure. So, um, now, I'll, uh, as you can see from the title of the slides, I'm going to be talking about what is nowadays known as grounding. Uh, I'll be more precise about what we mean here by grounding, but just to give you a general idea, uh, grounding is, a, is an explanatory relation which is receiving quite a lot of attention lately in different areas of philosophy. Actually, we could say that properly different relations are uh, called grounding and studied under this name. So, as I said, I'll be more precise later. Um, but in general, grounding is receiving a lot of tensions in philosophy and also uh, quite a lot of formal work is being devoted to the analysis of grounding uh, either in formal settings or um, in, in the sense of formalizing different notions of grounding, not necessarily formal notions. Um, we could say that the, the study of grounding from a formal perspective is quite advanced and quite uh, interesting results have been achieved, but certain issues are still quite problematic and what we are trying to do today is precisely uh, tackle one of this and in particular uh, the issue of defining grounds for quantified sentences so existential sentences and universal sentences and in this context it has been shown that what could be considered uh, a mainstream or standard way of formalizing grounding um, generates paradoxes so as quite serious technical issues in quite natural fields of application. I'll be more precise about this later as well. Obviously. And uh, what we will do today is propose a different approach to the formalization of grounding, um, which is in particular, as you can read, inspired by the analysis by Bernard Bolzano on what nowadays is actually translated as grounding or and he called Abfolge which can be considered as one of the forefathers of the modern grounding relation. Right, so this is the idea, and the hope is also to, uh, to suggest that uh, the interest of different ways of approaching the, 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 the task of formalizing grounding could be interesting in, in view of this, on this issue. Right, so let me begin with a few words about grounding in general. As I said, uh, there are really different relations or notions which nowadays are called grounding. Uh, grounding in metaphysical context is supposed to be, in certain cases, is considered as a relation possibly between facts or even objects. In our case, we are just considering uh, grounding as an objective and explanatory relation, uh, which is essentially non-causal between truths. So you could just um, you could just uh, take truth to mean true sentences. In our particular context, will be true formally. But, uh, but yeah, we will essentially fix this uh, this kind of relation. And objective, well, objective, it's quite clear, I think. Uh, non causal in nature just means essentially, in it's uh, in a sense how grounding was born uh, in the modern times. Essentially, the idea is that grounding is supposed to account for uh, those explanations, we could say, which do not essentially rely on a causal connection. And indeed, uh, it's quite uh, tied also in, in, in this history to the notion of reason, as in the reason why something is true or false. Right, so just to give you an idea, um, some intuitions about what grounding is supposed to be. This is very generic, then I'll, be, I'll go more into detail later. Now, the idea is that 
right, grounding relate to, as I say, two sentences in our case. One is called the ground and the other the consequence. And the idea is that the ground is supposed to determine the consequence. For example, the truth of the ground is supposed to determine the truth of the consequence. Or uh, one could say that the ground is supposed, as I said, to, to constitute the reason why the consequence holds. And often in philosophy, you can also find the expression in virtuof to express grounding links. Uh, in that case, the consequence holds in virtuof the ground. Right? Uh, considering its explanatory nature, almost, almost always, not, not always, but quite often, Grounding is supposed to be irreflexive and anti-symmetric. By this, I, in particular, I mean nowhere reflexive and nowhere symmetric. So nothing is supposed to be a ground of itself, and because from an explanatory point of view, would be a circular explanation. And, and similarly, if A is something is a ground of uh, something B, then B is supposed not to be a ground of something A because again, it would be circular. Right. More in particular, as I said, we will consider um, the task of, of uh, essentially formalizing grounding, and in particular of studying what is uh, often called logical grounding. Now, essentially logical grounding is the study of uh, the formal features of grounding as restricted to a logical language, right? So we are studying the grounding connections between formally, right? So logical sentences, we could say, um, which essentially depend on the logical structure of form. So you could see it as a limitation of grounding or um, something like over grounding which is proper to, to logical contexts. Now, in general, this is not a definition, but it's sort of a description of what usually people try to do, try to capture while working on logical grounding. We could say that the logical ground of a formula F is usually a multiset of formulae, G1, Gm. A multiset, uh, is, you can just see a multiset as a list where the order doesn't matter. So you might have, it's not a set because you might have repetitions, but the order of the formula is not important. Right? So the ground would be G1, Gm of a formula F. And in general, they, mm, roughly the requirements are that F should be true in V2 of the truth of G1, Gm in a sort of relevant way, so not just implication, but something more specific, uh, which depends on the notion of grounding adopted. And moreover, usually there are some simplicity conditions. So the idea of explaining or of giving reasons is also quite tightly related to the idea of simplifying, right? When I explain something, I'm trying to simplify the information for the, for the who receives the information. In a logical context, usually something like uh, logical complexity is used, but in general, a notion of complexity. Uh, and the ground is supposed to be simpler according to the chosen complexity than, than the consequence of it. Right? This is roughly the idea. Now, often, in the context of logical grounding, uh, inferential rules are used to characterize grounding relations. Uh, in what sense? In the sense that, so, Roughly, um, as I say, the idea is that the truth of G1, Gn should, should determine the truth of F. So at least should imply it. Right? So it's very natural to see grounding links as characterized by inferential rules. And here, uh, you have an example. The idea is simply usually in an inferential rule, I don't know if you're familiar, but some of you certainly are, but the, the, the premises imply the conclusion, right? In this case, we have uh, stricter rules, more uh, with a more specific connection between the premises and the conclusion. And the idea is precisely that uh, the premises of grounding rule should constitute a legitimate ground for the conclusion. Right. So, in a sense, if you read the the rule uh, uh, upside down, you have the, the conclusion is explained by the premises. In a sense, if you stress the explanatory nature of ground, but. In general, technically, uh, rules of this kind are, are used to characterize, formally capture different grounding notions. Now, I presented here this rule both to give you just an idea of what we mean by a grounding rule and also to start introducing the elements of the, of the problems that we are going to study. So, this in particular is a grounding rule for an existential statement, right? As you can see, the conclusion 
is a, an existential sentence. So here we're saying there is an x such that f of x. So something which is f exists, where f could be any property or complex formula. And um, this rule in particular comes from uh, what is usually known as full grounding approach, uh, which is, we could say, sort of a standard way, standard approach to the formalization of grounding. And the idea behind this rule is that in order to give a ground to an existential statement, is enough to provide a positive example, right? So the premise is f of t, which is just essentially a formula stating that some term t, which is a name for any object essentially, well, for a specific object, just uh, there is no restriction, let's say, on the object you can use there. Um, and the formula is stating that uh, the object named by t enjoys the property f, right? So, if you give uh, a positive example of something enjoying the property f, this, according to the rule, is a legitimate ground uh, for the existential statement. Right. So I would say, this might be a personal view, that already at an intuitive level, this corresponds to a quite uh, loose or weak, we could say, notion of explanatory relation. Because essentially you're saying, to explain why certain objects exist, it's enough just to provide one, any example, right? Uh, for example, if the, the existential statement is there are even numbers, you could just say because, uh, I don't know, 82 is an even number, which is fine, certainly quite intuitive and nothing particularly wrong with it. But I would say as a notion of, of, of explanation could be considered a bit of, a bit of a weak one. But you don't need to trust your own intuition about this because actually it has been shown that this kind of approach creates quite serious technical problems already for quite simple uh, contexts of application as I mentioned before. In particular, in uh, 2010, Frank showed uh, that if we extend calculate defined on the base of a full grounding approach with uh, theories which are quite naturally connected uh, to grounding, for example, truth theories or theories about facts or similar, um, we, we can actually generate paradoxes essentially related to, uh, to grounding. Um, I, I talk about natural extensions of the grounding calculi uh, in the sense that the examples are not, uh, I don't know, technical strange examples precisely aimed at creating problems, as might happen sometimes, but are really theories that you would like to be able to combine with the grounding calculus. For example, if you formalize a notion of grounding, it's quite natural to, to want to study the formal relationship between grounding and truth in a formal sense, right? Because they are quite well-connected notions and similarly for the notion of fact. So just to mean that these are problems which I think should be taken seriously. Now, let's see one of these uh, paradoxes. So this is a sort of a simplification of one of the paradoxes presented by Feynman and also other people who uh, have some papers about this. Um, so in this case, we just take, so suppose we have a grounding calculus also containing the existential rule that we have just seen. And suppose we extend it by a truth theory, very simple one. So technically, what's a, pr a truth theory? We just add a, an interpreted predicate T for true, and a quotation mechanism, as you can see in the second line, uh, such that we can take any formula F, quote it with these angle quotes, and obtain a term, uh, essentially, um, which constitutes a name for the formula, in such a way that we can apply our predicate T to quotations of formulae, and just express that the formula is true. Right, so T of F just means F is true. Now, if we do this, we need essentially a grounding rule for the truth predicate, because the idea in general is that you should have one grounding rule for every connective or uh, every interpreted element in your language. So we also need something for our newly added truth predicate. And the obvious choice is the rule that you can see here. Here we're just saying that uh, Essentially, in order to ground the sentence stating that f is true, you just use f, right? So in, in, in natural language, it would be 
uh, f is true because f, right? Something quite interesting. Uh, but if we do this, we already have a, a quite directly a serious problem. Indeed, so in particular, we have this. I mean, we have the existential rule I showed you and uh, our truth theory with the grounding rule for the truth rate. Um, why do we have a problem? Because if we consider the sentence, there is something which is true that you can see there, right? Uh, first of all, we can very clearly, you can see it uh, on the left here, um, we can clearly use the sentence, there is something which is true, to ground the sentence, it is true that there is something which is true, because you can do it forever for a But our sentence is also an existential sentence, so uh, we can try and ground it. And in particular, our rule coming from the mainstream approach tells us that we can pick any instance of the sentence, as long as it is true, and use it as a ground. So what we can do is quote the sentence itself, and we obtain a term, and then plug the term in the sentence to obtain uh, an instance of the sentence. And we have that, right? So we ground, um, there is something which is true, by its particular instance constructed quoting itself, which is, it is true that there is something which is true. And here you can see that we have right, two grounding rules where the premise of one is the conclusion of the other and vice versa. So we have a cycle, right? So a symmetric instance of grounding. Moreover, if we are considering a transitive notion of grounding, which sometimes is the case, we also have um, a reflexive instance, actually two, because both, by transitivity, both formally ground itself. So, uh, we could say that our thesis in this talk, or at least the motivating idea, is that this problem uh, can be solved if we, uh, if we consider that they are generated by the fact that actually the uh, full grounding approach uh, presents, in general, but in particular for the existential quantifier, rules which are too liberal. So, our idea here is essentially to propose a different notion of grounding, which is stricter, and uh, show that if we adopt this kind of notion, these problems don't arise. Right? So, and try to, uh, to obtain, in particular, for quantifiers, stricter grounding rules, where when we mean that the, uh, the premise explains the conclusion, we mean a, essentially a stronger notion of explanation. Uh, very well. So in order to do this, I'll start by briefly motivating uh, the additional requirements, essentially, that we have on the ground relation. Uh, very, very roughly, we could say that in the full grounding approach, and this is quite clear from the existential rule, as far as truth determination is concerned, the ground should be sufficient with respect to the conclusion. It right? should imply it. And then there are complexity constraints, but not much more. Not completely accurate, but roughly you can picture this. Uh, and now I would like to show you some remarks by Bernard Bolzano, uh, whose picture is, and um, which are exactly those that we, which are interesting for us with respect to the quantifier <coughs> rules. Uh, but the notion of grounding I'll present is based essentially in general in its analysis. And, uh, and so there are uh, also other requirements and other parts which are interesting, but obviously for time reasons I'll just focus on the, the relevant one for us today. First of all, at some point, so Bolzano discusses his notion of grounding that he calls up for, as I said, modernly is actually translated as grounding, in his uh, main philosophical uh, work, which is the theory of science. And um, for him, grounding is a kind of derivability relation, but with stricter uh, conditions, essentially, and very essentially related to explanatory clearness and the notion of reason. Uh, so it makes sense, actually, to call it grounding and to connect it to more than grounding. Now, a first remark I would like to, to discuss by Bolzano is the following. It's quite simple. <coughs> at some point, he says, every distinct ground has a consequence, which is, at least in some parts, distinctly so, right? So essentially what Bolzano is saying here is that if we have uh, two grounds, G1 and G2, for the same consequence C, right, they should be the same ground. Right? Because if we actually have distant grounds, also the consequence should be in some part distant. 
So what is it? Uh, what he is saying here is, in a sense, is proposing a ground uniqueness constraint, right? So if you want to give the ground of something, the ground should be. I mean, if you look for the ground of something, uh, the ground should be unique, right? You'll be able only to find one. In a sense, he's proposing a notion of V reason why more than A reason why. Uh, second remark, which I find very interesting, is the following. A bit more complex, but uh, we'll try and, and clarify it. Uh, the remark is the following. Who does not feel that the connection between ground and consequence is much more intimate than it would be if the mere fact that some of the grounds and consequences are combined in thought were supposed to make only one ground and one consequence out of them? So what he's saying essentially is the following. If we have two legitimate grounding claims, right, G1 grounds C1 and G2 grounds C2, um, the mere operation of combining the two grounds for no reason, just because we had, right, we considered them and put them together, shouldn't construct a legitimate ground for the combination of the consequences. So what he is saying here, I think, uh, is that in a sense, the ground should globally be relevant with respect to the consequence, right? So we shouldn't have a relation that we can just combine for no reason. When we explain, we shouldn't have that just part of the explanation explains part of the consequence and other parts are related to other parts. Um, but we should really have a sort of a global relevance of the ground with respect to the consequence. Um, and in particular, if we have this, and this is well, quite obvious uh, also in the, in the context of modern grounding, um, if we have that G is a ground of C, we shouldn't be able to, do the, to, to infer in general that G is also a ground of C, and, right? This is quite obvious. Because in this case, the, the problem would be even more serious than the one discusses Bolzano, so we would have actually a part of the consequence which is not at all related to the ground. So I present this to, uh, to present a sort of uh, complete determination criteria. So in a sense, we don't want a, a grounding relation in which it's, it's possible to have uh, just partial determination or just parts determining parts but not uh, a global relevance relation. Now, <coughs> by following uh, these two requirements, and as I said, many more, in general, by following Bolzano's analysis of the grounding relation, in 2016, uh, and uh, for the proof theoretical part in 2018, Francesca Poggiolesi proposed uh, formalized a notion of grounding, of logical grounding, based on, on Bolzano's analysis. Just to be clear, Bolzano's analysis is not merely logical. So for him is the derivability relation, but uh, it can be applied to science, mathematics, and actually the moral issues. Uh, While well, what we are presenting is a formalization in the restricted context of logic of this kind of analysis. Um, and the, the resulting notion, as I said, is stricter than, let's say, the standard way of formalizing grounding. Uh, in, again, to give you an intuition, if we consider a full ground, so the standard way of formalizing grounding as a sufficient condition, this is more similar to a necessary and sufficient condition by following the complete determination requirement. In a sense, this is a bit vague, but just to give you some guidelines. Now, uh, a sort of semantic definition of complete grounding is the following. Now, I won't be super precise because the precise part will be proof theoretical, so I use inferences, inference rules but just to give you an idea that it, we can, in a sense, provide a semantic definition of complete grounding as well. And the three conditions are um, those that you can see here. First of all, notice that for complete grounding we also need a notion of condition or context. Right? So we have gamma, which is the ground, A is the consequence, and we also have this notion of context or condition C. Uh, later I think to be clear why, why we need it. Uh, but so if we consider this, the, the three requirements that we have for complete grounding are uh, 
that the consequence should be derivable from the ground, quite obviously, so the ground should be a sufficient condition with respect to the consequence. Uh, moreover, under our context, let's say, or we could say all the rest being we equal, in a sense, if, we, if the ground is false, by now let's just read the notation as is false, then I'll explain it. If uh, the ground is false, we can, in our context, with by the falsity of the ground, infer the falsity of the consequence. So this is sort of a weakened uh, necessity condition, right? So we, if we negate the ground, we can negate, we can imply the negation of the condition. And moreover, we have a complexity requirement, according to which our condition and the ground together are less g-complex than A. Now, g-complexity is a modified version of logical complexity. So it's a syntactic notion of complexity, uh, which we could say adapt logical complexity to the idea that grounding is about positive determination. So in a sense, not every connective uh, increases the complexity, but also positive connectives or pairs of negative connectives. Now, if you want to know the detail, I can be more precise, but the idea is really that the complexity is a syntactic complexity based on logical complexity but considering the positive uh, nature of grounding, let's say. And saying this, I can also explain the notation. Essentially, when we write the small bottom to the right of a formula or a multiset, we call it the, the converse of the formula. And it's always equivalent to the negation of the formula, uh, but is always as g-complex as the formula. So sometimes we add the negation, sometimes we remove one negation. This is, let's say, just a technical way to uh, represent the falsity of the formula by using the negation in a, right, uh, let's say, a suitable way. So these are our um, formal requirements for the complete grounding relation. And now I'll, I'll show you the propositional part of the calculus. So essentially, these rules exactly capture the kind of relation that I that corresponds to the three requirements. Now, just I won't discuss all the rules, just a couple of examples to give you an idea. Um, first of all, we can consider the first rule on top, on top left uh, of the slide. This is the rule for conjunction. It's quite an obvious one. Actually, it's, it's the same for, for full grounding. Uh, essentially, what we're saying here, I, I recall that I um, remind you that the, the premises constitute the ground of the conclusion, just to be clear. So what we're saying here is essentially, if we want to ground the conjunction, the ground must contain both contracts. This is quite obvious, right? If you want to imply the conjunction, you need both. And uh, if, you, if, you, if the conjuncts are false, if you right, negate the conjuncts, you can imply the negation of the conjunction. For this junction, we already have quite a, something a bit more interesting. Um, first of all, as you notice from the second rule here, if uh, both disjuncts of a disjunction are true, both must be mentioned in the ground of the disjunction. Here we can really see the complete part, the complete nature of complete ground. Essentially, it's requiring a complete account of the truth of the conclusion, right? So if uh, uh, both A and B are true, the disjunction is true because both are true, right? And this technically comes from the necessity requirement. Because if you just uh, put A in the ground, the negation of A doesn't imply the negation of the disjunction, just to give you the technical insight. But obviously, a disjunction can be true also if only one disjunct is true. And for these cases, you have the next two rules. So suppose A is true, right? In that case, it's reasonable to say that A is the only reason why the disjunction is true. But for technical reasons, we need to specify essentially that B is false. So that's why we have this notion of context. When you read the rule, essentially, you have that to the left of the bar, you have the ground, A, and to the right, you have the context. And intuitively, you could read this rule as saying, A is the complete ground of A or B, considering that B is false. Right? So in a sense, you are guaranteeing by the condition that A is the complete ground. It's the only reason why this is not true. Then we have rules for uh, implication, which are modeled after disjunction, because it's 
essentially classical setting, uh, a rule for double negation, and then you could have uh, like one general rule for negations. It can be done. It's a bit more complicated. Here is not so important. So I just put explicitly a rule for negated uh, for negated conjunction, disjunction, and, and implications. Um, very well. Now. Uh, right, so in the calculus we also have a notion of uh, ground theoretic equivalence, which is similar to what some people call uh, propositional equivalence uh, or uh, propositional identity, not, not quite, it depends on the notion. We have a quite uh, conservative notion of uh, ground theoretic equivalence. So in general, ground theoretic equivalence, it means that um, if two formulae are ground theoretic equivalent, they should be considered as the same ground. So if you say that, for example, ground and consequence, so are equivalent with respect to our notion of grounding. So if, for example, you can use B and A to ground something, you can also use A and B. There is no difference. Essentially, they are the same formulae with respect to our relation. This is important because grounding doesn't uh, uh, is not robust with respect to logical equivalence. So you can have logically equivalent formulae which are not equivalent with respect to grounding. So I'll also discuss this briefly in the book. So the equivalents we use are this. Uh, as I said, they are quite conservative, not particularly strong. We just have a commutativity of uh, conjunction and disjunction and associativity of um, conjunction and disjunction. And, but there is quite, quite some literature then certainly these are widely accepted. Someone uses a bit more of, of these equivalences, but that's what we use. And technically, it's not so essential for us right now, but explicitly we can add rules to, to impose this in a procedural way, which is not always the case, but it can be useful for something I'll discuss in the conclusion. Uh, so essentially we can um, define rules such that you can transform formally in equivalent formally inside other formula. So I think that it's just a technical remark. Or there are other ways, more, more uh, possibly simpler ways to do this, but it can be done explicitly. Now, by now I just talked about the propositional part, but, uh, but I promised some work on quantifiers, so let's move to the, to the main topic. I'm sorry, how much time? I have like half an hour. Okay, perfect. Um, Right, so what about quantifiers? Now, as I said, the important uh, constraints for us today are essentially complete determination and ground uniqueness. And if we think of uh, the existential quantifier in particular, these are not very, there is, is not really uh, very intuitive to see how we can impose this, impose this to a sound rule for the existential quantifier. Because in logic, usually, existential quantifiers are treated, are introduced by specific examples uh, and, and it's not easy, even thinking about it, it's not easy to find a formula which is equivalent to an existential formula, uh, especially a simpler formula. So what we would like to have is a, an instance right, of the existential formula which is equivalent to it because complete determination technically means that the formula implies the existential formula and the negation of the formula implies the negation. So in a sense we have double implication, right? Um, this is, I would say, if we think about it in naive ways, not clear how to do it, uh, but, but that's what we wanted to do. So we essentially digged in the literature and we found out that a quite uh, interesting solution can be found <coughs> in the world by Hilbert. So Hilbert, um, introduced in order to uh, what, what is called the, the epsilon operator in order to uh, essentially define the behavior of quantifiers both existential and, and universal uh, by not using quantifiers so by using operators on terms right so by using what are called ground formulae formulae without quantifiers to obtain something which is exact which behaves exactly as a quantifier and the epsilon symbol uh, can be used exactly to do what, what we uh, proposed, uh, what we had uh, in mind to do. 
So what is the epsilon symbol or epsilon operator? Um, it's just an operator on, on formulae, such that if we take a formula f of x, so a formula with a free variable x, uh, we, can we can apply the epsilon symbol, which is the, the epsilon indeed, to the formula in a sort of uh, binder fashion, and we can construct something which is a term, epsilon x f of x, right? So in, in a way similar to a quotation mechanism, but not quite. Um, now, epsilon x f of x is supposed to be a name for an indeterminate object enjoying the property f, right? So epsilon x f of x can be read as something which is x, some object, right? Uh, which is f, sorry. Some object which is f. Um, it, it's been used also in philosophy of language. It's quite interesting for pronouns and, and similar things. But as I said, it was introduced in a, essentially a mathematical context. Hilbert had in mind to prove uh, consistency results. Uh, now, what are the properties of the epsilon symbol? But quite simply, it's quite intuitive if, if you consider its interpretation. Essentially, the property f applies to epsilon x f of x if and only if there are some object that enjoys f, right? Because you can show that some indeterminate object enjoying the property f actually enjoys the property f only if there exist objects enjoying the property f, right? Otherwise, the name is just a name for something that don't exist, uh, you could say. Um, from a theoretical perspective, we can introduce in this way the epsilon symbol, right? If we provide a specific example of something enjoying the property f, we can uh, introduce the epsilon symbol and, and <coughs> Did uh, conclude the sentence f holds for an indeterminate object and join the property. Intuitively, what you're doing here is uh, providing a concrete example and then abstracting it, right? Rather than just uh, uh, giving the example, you move to a sentence stating that there is a class, or actually there are some indeterminate objects and join the property up related to which you gave the example. Now, how do we use this? Ah, no, just another small remark before the, the main rule. Uh, it's interesting, in particular with respect to grounding, that epsilon x f of x is indeterminate, as I said, but it's a fixed object, right? So if you use it twice, you refer always to the same object. And that's, why, that's how it's used also in philosophy of language. So if we have a formula like this, this might also be clarified. Oh, sorry. The f should be a big f, not a small one. If we have a formula like this, we should read it as um, some indeterminate object enjoying f enjoys the property g, and it also enjoys the property h. Right? So it. So it's always the same. And this, with respect to ground uniqueness, is a quite interesting property. Uh, again, f here should be a big f property. Now, so how do we use the, the epsilon symbol? Maybe here it's already clear. Uh, we use it to obtain our instance of the existential claim, which is uh, simpler, logically simpler, than the existential formula, because it's just, we remove the existential quantifier, just instantiated. And it's uh, logically equivalent to the existential formula. So, if, so the, the premise implies the conclusion, and if we negate the premise, we can imply the negation of the conclusion. So how could we read this? In a sense, this rule is forcing you, uh, is doing something very similar to the full grounding rule, but forces you not to commit to a specific example. So if we go back to the, uh, to the example with even numbers, right? you cannot anymore say there are even numbers because 82 is an even number, or 16 is an even number. What you should say is something more in the direction of uh, there are even numbers because some number is of the form n plus n or something like that, right? I mean, here the intuition is very vague because we are in pure logic, so not clear. But essentially, I would say the interesting intuition is that the rule forces you not to commit to a specific example, but to provide a, a sort of a blueprint of an example which represents the old class of objects you're talking about, in a sense. Uh, very well. Now let's move to the other 
the other quantifier, so the universal quantifier. Now, in the context of uh, full grounding, usually rules similar to this one are used for uh, grounding a universal claim. So we have a claim of the form every object is f, or for every x, f of x. And the idea is essentially that to ground this, a universal claim, we need to provide essentially an exhaustive list for that for every object of the domain guarantees that the object enjoys the property f, which would be the list fc1, fc2, fc3, and so on. Right? So the idea is I, I, I find a list of names, c1, c2, c3, that name all objects in my domain, and I prove for each of them that f holds for them the object, and so on. Obviously, in general, this list of formulae could be infinite, because I might have infinite domains, uh, which is already, it could be problematic if we want to stress very much the epistemic features or outcomes of grounding, right? If we are in a metaphysical context and we care about uh, fundamentality in an ontological way, this makes completely sense. If you want to see grounding really as explanatory in a more epistemic sense, this could be problematic because then your explanation would be an infinite list of statements, right? So, but there is an even more serious technical problem here. The point is that if you didn't have the left most premise, right? So if you only considered these premises here, which are the intuitive ones, I would say, then the premises wouldn't imply the conclusion. Because even if the list is exhaustive, uh, nothing guarantees that it is, right? So if you don't know your domain and you consider purely the logical soundness of the rules, even though C1, C2, C3 are really all the objects in your domain, you don't know, right? You have no way to know that just from a purely linguistic point of view. So you have to add the premise guaranteeing that, which is what is usually called the totality fact, which is this one, which is telling you exactly for every object you take, it will be named by at least one of my constants, my name, right? So if you have this and that, then you can indeed imply the conclusion. Now, what's the problem here? Well, we have a complexity issue, because then we don't only have an, in an infinite number of premises, but we actually have an infinite premise, so a formula which is infinitely long. And it's moreover a universally quantified formula. So you cannot even argue, well, we removed the universal quantifier. I think it's tricky. There are some solutions that I don't find too satisfactory. For example, someone says, let's just consider the totality effect as an atom of complex, uh, as having complexity zero. Uh, that doesn't feel like a solution, more just like ignoring the problem. So, and moreover, also technically, infinitary logics, so logics where you have infinite formulae, might have very different properties with respect to normal logics and I mean it's, uh, it's not obvious uh, how to treat them in some cases. Very well, so what do we do? Let, let's uh, go back to the mathematical examples again for a moment. Suppose you want to prove that all triangles have uh, the, the internal sum of the angles of, uh, of any triangle is 180 degrees, right? So what do you do? Usually what you do is you consider a generic triangle, right? You suppose you have a triangle, you, you don't care whether it's uh, uh, equilateral or, or whatever, right? You just take it as a generic object. So you have no assumptions on the triangle um, except the fact that it is a triangle. And then you reason about it, you do some computation, and you, you end up by showing, if you're good at it, it <laughs> that the property holds. And then you say, well, but I had no assumptions on the triangle, so what I just did, I could do for any triangle. So essentially, I showed that all triangles in uh, Essentially, we, we use this trick, which is also very common in proof theory, I'll say that later. Um, and the idea of using arbitrary objects uh, for proving universal things, right? Um, so first of all, the solution what we are saying is essentially the ground of the universal sentence every object to enjoy the property f is an arbitrary object to enjoy the property f, or the arbitrary object, you could say. Uh, a then is just a constant that we have in our language, which is a name for an arbitrary object. 
Now, fine develop, keep fine develop uh, a theory, so calculate and semantics for arbitrary objects. So <coughs> what he does is more general uh, and more, complica more complicated than what we do. We essentially took his idea, simplified, and took what we needed because we have a very limited use of what he presents and apply it here. Uh, but the idea is exactly the same, right? So uh, let's not use proof theoretical conditions, free variables, and so on. Let's explicitly put in the language something which is supposed to be a name for an arbitrary object. Uh, why do I mention uh, proof theoretical conditions and variables? Because this trick, right, the, let's say the, tri the generic triangle idea, is often used in proof theory. So if you want to show that the universal claim exists, what you do is provide a generic proof, essentially. A proof for an X on which you have no assumptions. The problem is that we cannot do it here for, for grounding, because then we would have a formula which, uh, such that in the formula, with respect to the language, nothing guarantees that the object is arbitrary. Right? The condition is on the proof. Uh, what we need here, if we want to define as a grounding as a relation between formulae, is a way to internalize this condition in the language, right? So it, to explicitly have uh, constants in the language which are supposed to be names for arbitrary objects. And this is exactly what we do, essentially. Um, right. So this is our solution. Just a few words about arbitrary objects, as I said, right? Uh, is essentially what you usually do in proof theory, but internalize in the language. Uh, the problem, if you want to internalize the notion of arbitrary object in the language, is that it's not consistently axiomatizable, or at least you trivialize the domain. Because the property of an arbitrary object is that it enjoys all properties and only properties that all objects enjoy. Right? That, that's exactly what we want. Mm -hmm. We could say the intuitive notion of arbitrary. Odd. But if we just uh, write an axiom saying this, uh, either you have only one object in the old domain or it's inconsistent because, well, you can do the math or you can ask details later, but you get it. Um, so, as I said, Fine proposed the, proposed the theory for that, quite complete one, uh, with also the possibility of defining arbitrary objects with a certain property, so as for example the arbitrary triangle or something like this. We took just uh, essentially a fragment of it and proof theoretically is very easy to formalize that part. Essentially, you uh, impose proof theoretical condition on the free variables, saying if I have a generic proof with no assumption on x for any variable x, of f of x, that the thing you can read here, then you can introduce the statement that f holds for the arbitrary object. So we mix the for introduction, but we use them then. And then we have the grounding rule telling you that at that point f of a is essentially generic by meaning, by semantics, and then you can use it for the ground. Very well. Now, what does this mean with respect to the paradoxes? So if you consider the calculus I presented with the propositional part and these quantifier rules, so using arbitrary objects for the universal grounds and uh, the epsilon symbols or indeterminate objects for the existential ground, you can very easily formally show that no loop can occur in any way, right? So we never have reflexive or uh, symmetric instances, not even if we consider a transitive notion. Essentially, this is a very strict notion of grounding that always strictly simplifies. So you really have no possibility of loop of any sort. But this is for the logic, which is not, uh, not so interesting because the problem was, was arising when we extended the calculus by the truth theory. But you can actually show, so we didn't write it down, I have to make a disclaimer, but we know how to do it. You can actually show that even if you extend the calculus with the truth theory, you can still show that no loop arises. So it's not as easy to show it as in the pure logic uh, case, but uh, you can define a notion of complexity, which is often used in truth theories. So essentially, there you need to consider also quotations. So you need the complexity 
of the formula and of the formula quoted inside, but you can do it with the with the recursion theory recursion theory um, techniques, which are often used in the context of truth theories. And then essentially, you can show that even with the truth grounding rule and the quantifier rules, you still always have a notion of simplification. Just to give you the rough intuition of the, the theme, um, if we use our rules, you cannot anymore use any positive instance of an existential statement to ground it, right? So you cannot quote a formula and use that quotation to explain, to ground the formula itself, right? Which was the direct loop that we could create. We do something similar with the epsilon symbol, right? But the epsilon symbol essentially is sort of a quotation of a simpler formula, right? So you still have some more complexity because you can quote formulae. But when you use quotations in explanations, you always use quotations of simpler formulae inside simpler formulae. I don't know if it's clear. It's a bit uh, not so easy to explain as well, but uh, you, can, you can show it, essentially. That you need a more, bit more complex notion of complexity than simply logical complexity, but in the loops don't, don't arise. OK. Now, uh, do I have some time? Uh, yeah, a bit less than 10 minutes. OK. Um, there you go. Now, very briefly, just to, so, so that uh, the conclusions make, uh, make a bit more sense, we can also explicit, because often uh, in logical grounding, um, you can explicitly have grounding as a relation between, or as an operator between formulae. Here we presented rules uh, uh, essentially metalinguistic rules, where grounding is represented as an inference step. But we can also internalize grounding itself in the language. Uh, essentially, you can just say, immediately after applying a grounding rule, you can introduce an operator encoding the old rule, right? So if gamma is gamma modulo C, uh, considering C is the ground of B, you can introduce the sentence. Now, this is a formula of the language. Gamma is the ground of B, considering the condition C. And the triangle would be the grounding operator. It's quite, quite easy. And you can also introduce rules to eliminate the connective and really treat grounding as another connective. Uh, in particular, we, what we use usually is factivity. So when you, uh, if you have a, that something is a ground of something else, both things are supposed to be true, right? Because you explain by using true things, true things. You cannot, uh, at least in the traditional view, then you can have more. But, uh, voila, so we have factivity. Essentially, if you explain something by a ground, you can infer from that that the ground is true, that the condition is true, and that, that the consequence is true. And moreover, we have a rule for, um, essentially, be able to derive the negation of illegal grounds, right? So if you suppose that, for example, A is a ground of A, you can infer an absurdity and then therefore prove that A is never a ground of A, for example. In our case, it is so. It's not reflexive. So. And the idea is simply that if uh, you have a grounding claim corresponding to an illegal rule, you can just infer the, the negation. This is one way of doing it. You could have different ones. But essentially, this gives you a way to, right, we can construct grounding derivations or use grounding steps inside logical derivations. And then we can introduce, right, reflect in the language what we have done uh, by an explicit grounding operator. Now, I have a couple of examples, just in case. For example, here we have, right, we start by, suppose we have axioms for identity, we start by B equal B, and suppose we can prove that B and C are different, just doesn't matter, uh, just starting points. We can, for example, ground the disjunction, right? Just like that. And then we can introduce the epsilon symbol, for example, by abstracting B, right? So we, we we had a sentence about B, now we are abstracting over B and just saying there is some object which is either equal to B or to C and 
or uh, or it is it oh maybe I got some ah no 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 sorry no you abstract over the old sentence sorry I, I was reading it wrong so essentially the epsilon symbol holds all this part right so you have an indeterminate object which is either equal to b or to c uh, and it is equal to b or it is equal to c not very intuitive, just to show how rules are applied. And from this you can ground the existential quantifier, and now you can introduce explicitly the, the grounding operator, right? And here you have your ground, which would be this one, and here you have your consequence, which would be this one. The statement essentially says the, the sentence with the epsilon symbol grounds the existential plane. Just to show you that we can write combine logical rules, grounding rules, and uh, so we also have the notion of immediate grounding because the, our notion of grounding is immediate, so it's sort of uh, the, the smallest explanatory step in a sense, but by, by the way we formalize it, you can also construct complex grounding relations and induce the notion of immediate grounding. Okay, here you have another example for the universal statement, but yeah, I guess I'll just go to the related and future work. Now, um, first of all, if we consider the propositional fragment that I showed to you, we can uh, define a calculus, uh, which is uh, not exactly the one I showed, but, but exactly equivalent to that one, in particular in which we make everything explicit. For example, I showed you explicit rule for the grounding equivalence, ground theoretic equivalences, Right? With that same idea, we can explicitate many things um, from the calculus that I showed you. And it's possible to show that this calculus normalizes, um, which means essentially that the grounding rules can be used as logical introduction rules, and they are, uh, let's say, balanced with respect to elimination rules. Or um, yeah, you could say that the, you could use explanatory rules and you have the same logical properties as uh, with the regular logical rules. Which I think is interesting because it gives you a notion of, um, it, it gives you a framework in which <coughs> grounding derivations are really a subset, a non-redundant subset of logical uh, proofs. Right? So we are not adding rules uh, which are redundant just to be able to construct also explanations, but we can really, we have a notion of, of logical reasoning such that some of the proofs that we need to have if we want a complete set of logical proofs are explanations. Right? So we can extract, the, we could say explanations from, or grounding derivations to be precise from logical proofs. Um, and by saying this, I covered the first two points. Uh, moreover, there is some work in progress, almost finished. Um, we, um, by, by employing the ideas that I showed in the last slides, right, the introduction of the grounding operator, uh, by these rules, just applied just below grounding rules, we can actually study sort of the behavior of grounding operators independently from the particular notion of grounding that, uh, that you have. Right? So essentially you can forget about the specific grounding relation and just study the features that all grounding operators that can be defined in a certain way share. And, um, there. and this also points at uh, another, I think, very interesting feature of grounding. This is a bit outside the study of grounding itself. But I think grounding is a very uh, interesting, um, let's say, notion with respect to logic because it's uh, one of the few hyperintentional operators. So I already mentioned this. Grounding essentially violates logical equivalence. Right? So you might have logically equivalent formulae, which are not equivalent with respect to grounding, which is a very interesting feature, but not many uh, operators of this kind have been studied. Grounding is one. So uh, I would say that a very interesting future work direction would be to right, try and generalize the results obtained for grounding also for other 
uh, hyperintentional operators, or even just uh, with respect to hyperintentional operators in general. So try and see whether there are common features from a proof theoretical perspective that can be kind of lifted from grounding to other similar operators. So this was all. I just put some uh, bibliography. And Simpler formula, right? The actual problem with symmetry is when you can, in a way, point to the formula itself, which you can do with the quotation mechanism, for example, right? Well, epsilon symbol gives you a notion of simplification because it, it kind of, right? You can only refer, at least how you use it in, in, in the rule, you no. always refer to a simpler formula. I'm just referring to the, the syntax, like when you're defining the, right. the language, not the, the rules, but the, ah, okay. defining the language. Ah, no, there yes. And then necessarily you have to use mutual recursion when you're recursively defining the language. Yes, yes, yes. yes. But, but I would say that kind of symmetry doesn't reflect on, on then on the grounding relation, right? I don't know. I'm just okay. No, I mean, yeah, because I mean, you can show that anyway you have a notion of simplification. That's the thing I was trying to do. I mean, essentially, you show that there are no loops in the relation, so you, you as a relation, it's uh, anti-symmetric anti or reflexive, both actually. Okay. So, or, uh, no, I don't know if you were pointing out. No, it's just an uh, observation. Okay, okay. Something that I was thinking about. Uh, thank you for, for a very clear talk, especially I'm not a logician, so I really appreciate it. But uh, beside the, the appeal to uh, Bolzano um, authority, mm -hmm. why, why should we choose this restriction in particular? Can you, can you tell us? In particular? That? Yeah, because it works. It gets right. rid of paradoxes. Yes. But w w why should I use this one? Well, what other, do you have in mind other ones? No. But, I imagine, <laughs> but imagine Bolzano had, had something in mind, so maybe it's in Bolzano. Yes, no, I think, I would say, I mean, you could, to me, it makes absolutely sense what Bolzano is saying. You could also argue that you, you might want different notions of, of ground, like loser or, or stronger. That's all right. I, I would say if you want to restrict the standard one, to mean not necessarily the standard one, but clearly full grounding as features that uh, that are quite natural and intuitive for grounding. Uh, so it makes sense to consider those as, as kind of minimum set. And if you want to restrict that, so impose requirements on that, uh, I would say there isn't much you can do, right? I mean, you possibly can formalize it in different ways. I'm not sure about that because I don't think it's so easy. If I understood Why not? the idea behind Bolzano, according to what mm -hmm. you said, it's something about completeness, complete determination, so there's yes. something about completeness. I, I call it like that, but yes. It seems to be the, 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 the core of the idea. 
and what would be the justification to, to decide it works? Yeah, yeah. Which no, 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 sure. No, the idea is really to, in a sort, to, to while well, Bolzano wasn't moving, but I mean, if you consider moving from full grounding to this notion, it's essentially not considering the notion of a reason, mm -hmm. but of the reason. Right? That, that's, I think, is the most uh, intuitive uh, reading of, of the issue. And I think in the logical sense, in the logical setting, it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, in general, you could want, obviously, it makes sense to study also the notion of a reason. No? I'm not saying it, it doesn't make any sense. But in the logical setting, it's very close to, to becoming almost trivial, right? I mean, many rules are just logical rules. And indeed, there is people criticizing, often people, not often, but some people say that when studying uh, logical grounding, it seems we are just studying right, logical entanglement. And sometimes it goes, very, it goes very close to something like that. So I would say in a logical setting, the, considering the notion of the reason, actually gives us something Am I correct to understand that it's the reason in a, with certain conditions, certain contexts? Yes, exactly. So it's a, it's a complete reason relative, relative to, to say, yes, yes. That, that's the notion you want to get yes, to, exactly, yes. to this trick. Okay, thank you very much. Another question? I have a lot, but... <laughs> 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 But uh, so th thanks a lot for a great talk and a great paper. Um, uh, so so I'm, I'm a big fan of the full grounding uh, approach. So so I'm not that. <laughs> I mean, I'm an interesting uh, uh, opponent, I guess. Uh -huh. uh, uh, so um, uh, well, the the issue is that there's. Um, or one of the issues I see in this notion of com the complete notion is that the weight or the importance of the the simplicity requirement mm -hmm. is very is, 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 is very present. Uh, yes. It is, and it seems to be a little bit arbitrary. There seems mm -hmm. to be something non -metaph metaphysical about it. Uh, like it's a it's a logic logician's decision that this formula mm -hmm. is more simple than than this one. And why I think it's more it's more of an issue for the complete grounding theorist than for the full one mm -hmm. is that um, there is some symmetry uh, appearance in the complete one. Like mm -hmm. if it wasn't yes. for simplicity <coughs> reasons, yes. Um, yes, 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 yes. The, the the grounding relation could go either way. Yes. Um, yes. So so the simplicity is 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 really core. Um, and if you're going to define it syntactically, that seems to be sort of uh, a purely linguistic convention or mm -hmm. something, saying nothing about metaphysics, let's say, about yes. the world. Uh, um, and also in these examples, I mean, I see the intuition, and that's not the problem, but I mean, it, it, it's to some extent the, 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 the instantiation with the epsilon. Mm -hmm. um, operator, um, you could also say that that's more complex than just the extensional quantifier because it will be a longer oh, a formula, yeah, just I mean, more symbols. But just uh, that, with the, no, I'll, I'll let you finish, sorry, and then so, try to. So if, if, if we go back to the rule for, uh -huh. uh, for instantiation <coughs> of, uh, or for the, the introduction of the extensional quantifier, um, like, I mean, I see there's, of course, you can define a sense in which the, the thing above uh, the line, the double line is simpler than the thing below it. But you could also define a complexity measure where it's the other way around. Um, maybe just counting should, the symbols. Should I answer or should I wait for uh, them? Uh, yeah, no, if you get the, if, if, my, if my question is clear, then of yeah, course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> on this I would say that, but I mean, a term could be much more complex than the former, right? I mean, you could have a, a thousand function applications. So the idea is just also in the, in the full grounding approach, the idea is just that you remove the quantifier and you take an instance. Mm -hmm. But also there, 
the, the actual example could be very complicated. Yeah, you yeah, could yeah. have a, a huge term with the, right? So I don't know. I mean, here is really just logical complexity, simplification. So I mean, yeah, no, I, I agree on, on the rest of the, uh, the, the logical complexity is, in, uh, or the G complexity is essential for full grounding because for complete grounding, because the idea exactly is exactly that the, the ground should be equivalent. Yes. Logically equivalent to the consequence, yes. And the only, the asymmetry should be in the simplification. That's really al already in Bolzano very explicit. So that's exactly, I think also Aristotle says something like this. It should really be, right, complete, an if and only if, essentially, in a, logical, in a classical setting at least, from a logical perspective. And the simplification is really about, well, in this context, syntax. In a, in a more general, okay, so this is the answer with respect. So I agree completely that uh, the com logical complexity is key. And uh, in this case, it's a syntactic complexity, yes. And it's so that, that essentially uh, breaks the symmetry. And it's really supposed to be like that. Um, you can, right, you can like it or not, uh, but, but yes, that's an intention even, I would say. One, one possible uh, answer to what you said uh, concerning the, the metaphysical aspects, of, for example, that, for example, I would completely agree with you, and I would say, I mean, I, because possibly other people working on complete grounding see it in a different way, but for me, for example, complete grounding should really be the choice going towards uh, a more epistemic reading of grounding, right? So still in an objective sense, and, and uh, I mean, because we are in a formal context in, in a sense, so you could be objective without in a relative way to, <coughs> to the formal context. Uh, but with, the, with a lot of weight on the epistemic nature of the thing. Um, and indeed, uh, what you were saying about the simplification, which, which could indeed be a problem, because if you, if you take this kind of grounding as, uh, as a metaphysical one, you exclude a lot of things you would like to say, for example, with respect to atoms and similar things. But, um, so, in, as I presented logical grounding, and, and uh, for me that is very important, this is really, uh, to me at least personally, a study of grounding as restricted to those cases which only concern the logical structure. I see. Right? Uh, and indeed, and that's also part of uh, the project uh, Francesca and I are, are conducting, there is also an idea of going to theories, right? So, for example, in mathematics, we don't think so much uh, about metaphysics, but that could be as well one direction. But uh, for example, mathematics or scientific theories, any formal theory, let's say. Let's say. And then really you would have uh, to um, consider other kind of connections, mm -hmm. which is also what Balsamo does. So to me, this is really just the fragment about the logical structure. Uh, but I wouldn't, I personally would never argue that what is not captured by this uh, shouldn't be a ground of something else. Mm -hmm. In general, if we talk about connectives and logic, yes, but I completely agree that, that we might have atomic propositions grounding other propositions. Mm -hmm. I would just say that's not logical ground. Okay. That would be. And you were just talking about grounding. logical grounding here. I really, because okay. I, I also I tried to say it a bit, but it's, it's not, uh, I mean, it's not obvious how to do that. There are very different things people do and call logical grounding, right? Yes, yes, to, yes, me, yes. It's, to me, it's really uh, those connections that are purely due to the logical structure. Okay. And, and, and then uh, uh, I agree that something else must be done if we consider more extended set. And, um, and, and then, for example, what Bolzano does, and actually is something we, uh, Francesca and I, are trying to do for, for mathematics and geometry, is consider uh, a more general context in which essentially these connections are kind of preserved, so a sort of cons conservative extension. You need to take it in a bit this way. But where you, instead of having the notion of um, a syntactic complexity, or a complexity notion which is syntactical, you have a notion of conceptual complexity. And that's really sort of semantical complexity, mm -hmm. as it could be. 
Um, so I agree. This is limited, but it's, uh, mm -hmm. meant to be, sure, right? Sure, 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 sure. I completely agree. Uh, and uh, and the because other I took it more be... like when that Git finds says the logic of impure grounds, right? Which has also has such rules, right? Uh -huh. uh, but it's not logical grounding. It, it, it's features of ground in general that are logical. Yes, because um, the logic of impure ground is an extension, right? So yes. I would say it adds uh, this kind of analysis to a logic of grounding in general. Mm. What we have is just this part, right? So it's, it's not comparable, I would say. Right, okay. So it keeps together, I would say at least, it keeps together a, a formal system to describe the general features of, of grounding <coughs> in general to the behavior relating logic and grounding, essentially. What we have is, at least to me, I, I, I want to stress because I don't want to talk about other people's same sorry in this sense. What we have here to me is really just the links which are exclusively due to the logical structure. Okay. Uh, yeah. I had some other questions, maybe. I have some questions. Probably, you didn't ask any, you can. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Just a clarificatory one is about factivity. Yes. Uh, so factivity was introduced at the very end when you want to, to eliminate the grounding. Uh, so yes. somehow yes. introduce mm -hmm. grounding in the in the in the object language, uh -huh. and then you can eliminate it by factivity. However, I was wondering whether this is already at the beginning because otherwise it's a bit strange. So you have these rules mm -hmm. to go from classic. A, B, grounds, A and B, mm -hmm. and we didn't say anything about whether A and B have to be true. Uh, okay. And then yes. you introduce grounding, and then we have magically A and B as... F factivity, yeah. Yes. So I was... That's a clear So essentially, actually, I would say that this is one... Uh, because this calculus is kind of... Uh, has been developed by changing a bit the original one by Puzzolesi. And this is one of the main differences, I would say. So essentially, what you have is uh, what some people call potential explanations. Mm -hmm. okay. Obviously, you, you, right, because anyway you have formulae, so you don't, you cannot pick true formulae, you have to suppose they are true. This is quite obvious as a, as a background. But I would say that the theoretical behavior of the calculus uh, works perfectly without too many strange things with respect to the traditional uh, way proof theoretical rules work, in the sense that so when you, first of all, I want to stress, in these, in these rules, both premises must be derived or assumed, right? So we don't discharge any hypothesis. So what you have essentially is that you can apply a rule for grounding only if either you have proved that the formula is true, or you have assumed that the formula is true, or you have derived from assumptions that the formula is true, right? So essentially, suppose you just apply one rule, then what you have is uh, something saying, supposing that A is true and B is true, mm -hmm. they explain A and B. And what you can do, for example, is, uh, for example, when discharging comes into play, is, for example, when you introduce the, the connective, right? You, you could say, for example, um, you apply the true rule, then you derive that A comma B grounds A and B, and then you can, for example, introduce an implication and say, if A is true and B is true, then A comma B grounds A and B, right? So I would say that the, the behavior is exactly what you are expecting. The fact that you can derive uh, by the factivity rule matches this perfectly, because you can do it only if possibly you have open assumptions, so you have actually have assumed A and B to be true, mm -hmm. or if you have discharged them in some way, or possibly A could be a logical theorem, in that case, you can even prove it, right? Yeah. And, and so, uh, yes, I didn't mention, but I, we thought about this, and I think it, it should give, uh, it does give what, what you would expect. Uh. Okay, thanks. I have a kind of follow up on that. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, in the rules for the factivity, yes, sure. uh, there was, uh, yes, this, there was the one that you can uh, also get the condition. From there. And that's really surprising to me. Um, like if you say that, uh, given the context C, um, 
I can ground A on gamma, uh -huh. can we then conclude that the context is true or something like that? I, yes. I mean, no, because it, it's because like conditional. Like if the context is there. Mm, yeah. No. 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 But but how we use? I mean, that's my intuition, and I think it kind of matches with this as well. But our use of the context is really, for example, if we look at this junction, is really saying uh, A fully explains C, considering that B is false. So okay. while you say that, you actually are saying that B is false. Okay, okay. I mean, the context okay. intuition uh, is just one way of reading it. But, but when yeah, we use yeah, the yeah, context, yeah, yeah. it's really the actual context. Right. It's not like we're going to a context. No, 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 no. It's, it's, uh, no, no. It's just to okay. say that uh, that the context is not part of the explanation. Right. It's just something we need to add to make the explanation an explanation mm -hmm. in a sense. Sorry, I moved from explanation to grounding. Some people might complain. When I say explanation, I mean grounding here, right? So, for some, it's not the same thing. And actually, okay, but but I mean that. But no, our context is really. Actual, the actual is just the information from the rest of the truth. Right. Yes. <coughs> yes. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. But, uh, I would have another question. Maybe we can like, switch. <laughs> so. Ah. I had now said something. Yeah, <laughs> <forward>. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I was wondering if, yeah, I don't know the literature on this, but so. It seems very clear that in the case of introducing um, logical connectives like conjunction, disjunction, it's true that we go from something more simple to something more complex. Mm -hmm. But there seems to be a disanalogy in the case of the of the um, quantifiers, and mm -hmm. this sense of true in virtue of doesn't seem at least straightforward. Sometimes it seems more simple outside logic. In logic, it's true that we have this more simple, well, not in the case of the universal, but we want to have the same phenomenon that we have with the connectives in the case of the quantifiers. But sometimes it's more simple. In natural language, I mean, to say that something is true for every object, and this explains why this particular object and this particular object have something that can be more complex. So this true in virtue of, it seems to so, yeah, just the point that there is a this analogy mm -hmm. between, and whether this is something that is considered in the, in the literature, that there is this, this analogy. Uh, no, I mean, I don't know. Ah, you mean in general? Yeah, I don't know. Of, uh, ah, I mean, yeah, yeah. In, in no, possibly, yeah, the, the intuition of about really kind of parts, whole, in a sense, relation, that's probably closer to the full grounding approach for, for the universal quantifier, at least. Um, I agree, but it doesn't, I mean, uh, I don't think it, it, that's good, so, I mean, you might have the intuition possibly metaphysically it works. Uh, it's true that in our case the virtue of reading it loses a bit, uh, right, grasp uh, for the quantifiers. Yeah, but I still don't think the other is better. Possibly there is really kind of diverging intuitions concerning the quantifiers, right? Yeah. There is literature, for example, defending the, or at least discussing the fact that often we would like to have general facts, grounding specific facts, right? That's that could be the case. Uh, for example, Bolsan, for Bolsan, generality is, is a big filter of <coughs> explanation, for example, and the literature on explanation in general. Generality is very important. So you might add that uh, it's true. I think this is a hard, um, hard issue to settle because there are indeed conflicting intuitions. But I would say that if we restrict ourselves to, to, to a logical sense of the thing, uh, it, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense to say that the universal statement runs in the specific ones, while in other contexts might. Uh, for, for constructing, for constructing uh, logical formulas, yes, but maybe not for the for the genuine meaning of uh, for all x. Or yeah, I don't know. I mean, I really think that then it, it's an issue for which it makes sense to make clear what you're right. What do you mean by grounding in that context, right? Because 
uh, yeah, it seems that there are really different intuitions, all equally valuable because, well, we have nothing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but yes. So, so the discussion you just had is typical because, I mean, it's typical of people writing about branding is that mm -hmm. the, the model you have in mind of explanation is causal explanation, and after that you extend that to grounding, and you you look for the same feature, mm. like simplification, as in a way, in in a way. Yeah. But what you said is that the general case explained all the instants. The law explain all the instant. It's another way to understand explanation that is less interesting today. So it's not just a question of it, of intuition. I think it's a question of what is the thing you want to model. So my question, when you said it's an you want to read that as an epistemological, you insist on that in your discussion. Well, I, and, after that, and after that you went away from put more away from something else. else. But I, I would say just to be put more weight on the epistemic yeah, no, no, uh, no, byproducts. No, no, no. And, uh, and I can understand that. Okay. But, but you must have a notion in mind of what you want to map with formalism. You don't do formalism just to do formalism. Well, I'm sorry, you want to? You don't do formalism just to do formalism. No, so sure. You have, you have to an idea to map some idea of grounding, explanation. Yeah. That's why you switch to, to the other. So. So it's not oh, a question of intuition, it's something in the world, in the epistemic practice, that you want to, to, to map well? No, no, not in the epistemic practice, no. I would just say that, uh, so grounding is supposed to have uh, epistemic byproducts, right? So it's explanatory, it's objective but explanatory. Mm -hmm. And if you stress that, and if you take, for example, grounding, already just fixing that it's between truths, it already contains quite a clear choice, right? Um, but, so in that sense I was saying this but, but also the other thing I was saying I think is about intuition in the sense that if you consider uh, why people say that the general law explains the specific instances I think that's due to semantic issues right I'm confused, but so, uh, I trust you with that. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it's not clear. Uh, I'm not giving it as a, just as a solution, but um, it, it's not about the form, right? In that case, it's yeah. more about. Um, yeah, no, I would yes, not to say. But it's probably because I don't believe in the distinction clearly between syntax and semantics, so it's why oh, okay. I'm confused <laughs> about that. I think, I think. Every syntactic rules is just semantic described under the rug. And mm. we're, we're, you're not just putting symbols in an order. You, you, you oh, no, discard sure, sure. some, you apply some based on a certain conception or a certain model in your mind. Yeah. No, I guess what, we, you, what you call intuition. I, no, I guess what I would like to distinguish is when, I mean, because when you, if you look at explanation mathematics. Now I'm just talking about the final goal, right? This is sort of a dream, but when you look at explanations in the sciences or in formal context, but right with the, where you give meaning to the, to the names and everything, uh, you do have sort of a syntactic simplification, some steps uh, which are purely due to the form of your sentences, just, just like in a normal proof, even non-explanatory, and some parts which are actually due to the meaning of terms, right? So you say that zero is an even number, uh, sorry, zero is a natural number, not because of the form of the words, oh, okay. but because of the meaning of the terms. But at the same time, if you say that A implies B and A is true, that step is due to the form of the sentences. So uh, to me, it makes sense to try and, and treat the two problems, kind of, maybe not separately, but to first settle how you want to deal with the purely syntactical part, and then see how whether you can generalize it to, to a because it's harder essentially, right? To treat the syntactical part. Uh, so I would, uh, acclaim, in that sense. Yeah, I claim when you say the general sentence or the general formula explained the singular 
formula, it's a case of semantic, it's not syntax. Yeah, in that sense. And I'm, I'm not saying it's obvious how to combine no, the two, right? I just want to understand your purpose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, <laughs> something else. But I would say. Okay. Uh, and indeed, I mean, it is hard okay, because sometimes uh, simpler things are more complex semantically, and then you want to. It's not easy, you know? yes. But I think that dividing the problem could be one way. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah um, so I, I, I wondered whether um, you looked at applications of this uh, for uh, essence. Um, so it, For sorry? essence, uh, nature, ah. uh, the nature of no. facts, essence of uh. facts. I actually think it might be a good solution to a problem that uh, Kit uh -huh. Fine talks about in, uh, in Guide to Grounds, uh -huh. um, where he tries to, well, not reduce essence to ground, but uh, 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 saying to what, what extent we can learn something about essence of facts or essence of things uh, via their grounds. Mm -hmm. And he uh -huh. uses full ground the whole time, uh -huh. and it doesn't work, and okay. he has to look for an ad hoc solution for it. Uh, but actually, for complete ground, as you do it with the epsilon operator, mm -hmm. the problems seem to go away. Now, maybe you can quote the part from... Uh, uh -huh. So, um, he, he says that, uh, well, the nature of a fact, uh, well, it, it seems to lie in the nature of... You could think that it lies in the nature of a fact, uh, 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 that it is grounded, in such and such way, if it is indeed grounded. Mm -hmm. um, so that says something about the nature, the, the, the groundedness. Then he says, unfortunately, this view will not quite do as it stands. The fact that someone is a philosopher, we may suppose, is grounded in the fact that Socrates is a philosopher, and perhaps also that he exists and is a person. Um, but it does not lie in the nature of the fact that someone is a philosopher, that the fact is so grounded, given that Socrates is indeed a philosopher. So it, it's not uh, in the nature of, uh, of someone being a philosopher um, that uh, it is grounded by Socrates being a right. philosopher. It could also be grounded in Plato. And in right, it doesn't right, seem right. to yeah, be yeah. essential to the fact that someone is a philosopher. Mm -hmm. Uh, that the particular example he uses is ground. Yes. Yeah. yeah uh, right. I, I and think and that for complete ground, yeah. and especially with the essence of uh, the, the epsilon operator, I think that the whole problem goes away. Right. Because you don't commit to a specific. Example. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I. So I think. So uh, I think this is worth looking at. at, at yes. 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 No, no, I, I, I didn't remember the particular. Person. It's in. It's in quite quite a ground uh, section eleven. Mm -hmm. Essence yeah, and ground. Uh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, no, I think in general, I mean, saying that just any example is, is, a, is a ground is kind of problematic. Right? Yeah. I mean, the Well, no, I don't think it's a problematic okay. case. Of, <laughs> it's a problematic <laughs> case for essence. Uh, yeah, okay, really okay. 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 That, uh, it's already it a second case. It doesn't lie in the right? essence <laughs> of, of someone being uh, a philosopher that this is grounded by right. Socrates. By Socrates. Because Socrates because the, the grounding itself is not a problem for me, at least. Okay. Uh, no, no. No, I th I th thank th you very much for that. No, no, I should look into it. Yes, yeah, so, so I have a, 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 a non-technical question, also not a, not a logician, but um, I wanted to ask you about this epsilon operator a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really cool. Um, it, it's, it seems it seems extremely useful. For one thing, I mean, I'm thinking back to so I'm not a logician, but I did used to teach introduction to logic, and it it, it seems to be a lovely way to capture a pattern of reasoning that I think we probably all know is really natural for our students and very hard to convince them not to do. That is to say, when you introduce a name for something arbitrary, right. that you get to keep it for a while and okay. use it yeah. to do stuff, right? It's a very natural way to think and we really have to like beat this out of our students, right? That when you're trying to do existential introduction, you don't get to keep your name around. You have to be very careful with what you do with it. I'm wondering, I guess, I guess what I want to ask is, it feels like too good of a trick. So is there a catch? 
Like, are the semantics for this operator challenging? I mean, is there is there something about this operator that makes it problematic to use? Like, 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 it seems too good to be true to just be able to introduce this epsilon operator that that solves lots of these really right. challenging problems uh, and inference. I would say, I mean, you use a choice function essentially. I don't know if that's problematic for you, but yeah, okay, I mean, sure, of course it is. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, to to be, it's uh, expressive, vty wise. It's quite a lot of machinery, machinery because uh, you could actually eliminate all, right? You could, you could have a logic right. without quantifiers, actually even universal quantifiers, uh, just using the epsilon symbol. It's really a way to, to do all the work that quantifiers do just by names, by terms. Sure. So yeah. it's very expressive, but no, I would say it's quite. Uh, I mean, the semantics can be defined. It's, it's used and uh, it's very powerful. Yes. We, we actually use just part of it also. Just by, by the way, as a remark, it wouldn't work very nicely for the universal quantifiers. We could have technically. Be, but then when you use it, because essentially the epsilon gives you an example, and you can use it uh, showing that there is no counterexample, essentially, to characterize the universal quantifier. But showing that there is no counterexample is, is in, a third, in a sense non-constructive. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's using essentially double negation or abs classical absurdum, and for example, Bolzano, but it's quite common, it's quite clear about the fact that explanations shouldn't be by absurdity. So it felt felt quite wrong. But yeah, it's very just just to just to give a bit of context. Yeah, it is very expressive. Yes, it's it's. Uh, uh, but no, technically, it's not not as problematic as infinite logics, for example. I don't know. Or, uh, I don't see any catch. I think <laughs> that's <laughs> quite interesting. Nice, nice. Possibly the intuition is a bit right. That 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 yes. But technically no, I think it's a very neat solution to me at least. Cool. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Questions? I have not one but <laughs> <laughs> we have a bit more than ten minutes, so yeah, so this is a bit further away from your talk, but it's it's about the paradoxical thing you started from. And, um, mm -hmm. um, how shall I say this? Um, more and more, I get convinced that um, the only argument uh, uh, saying that ground <coughs> um, cannot be symmetric or is uh -huh. anti-symmetric is kind of a, a begging the question argument. Okay. It's like a dogma, uh, well, of course, crowd. Well, yeah. um, while I think there is no good reason to uh, to, to, mm. to impose this, um, if you have, uh, I don't know whether you you read this uh, this paper by Scott Dixon mm. uh, on the well-foundedness of grounding. Um, it well, he, he gives like a couple of, of several different ways to characterize the well-foundedness of grounding. There's mm. a mathematical sense which he says it's too restrictive and I agree with that. Okay. Um, but but the thing that seems to be quite right and, and I agree with that um, is that uh, for full grounding at least it's it's sufficient that every fact um, has uh, is fully grounded by fundamental facts or ungrounded facts. Okay. Um, so this allows infinite cycles, uh, sorry, no, not cycles, infinite uh, chains, as long as there is something below it that is more fundamental still. So you can go zero, minus one, minus two, uh -huh. minus three, minus, and then minus omega, for example, uh, so you would still be below You can have it. a cycle, but you could also choose to go below. In a yeah, sense. Well, 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 cycles, that's my own thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but there is just there is he also rejects uh, uh, and this uh, uh, rejects uh, symmetry. So, so he's totally ah, not uh, going in that direction. It's not well founded. Um, no. Yeah, but so 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 there's not well founded in the technical sense of the word when uh -huh. you have infinite chains uh -huh. um, are allowed as long as there is still something firm below. Ah, sort chain. of uh, like a limit. Yes, uh, and, and you can call this 
Yeah. It's, it's a like closed, uh, it's closed uh, set yeah. in a sense. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can have infinitely elements, but there is a. Uh, there is something on them. Oh, okay. That uh, that's that, that yeah, there yeah, yeah. be a minimal requirement on grounding okay, 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 that okay. there should for every fact be like a bottom. Uh, ah, okay. Even okay. though there can be infinite. So there is a, there is minimum, but not necessarily yeah. Yeah, yeah, discrete. Uh, but once you have this uh, uh, requirement, uh -huh. um, I don't think there is a need anymore for. Uh, Assume, assume for, for asymmetry, okay. uh, because it's not a problem that you are at some point in a loop if there is a way into the loop. That fixes your truth values unproblematically. Also, the, the example you gave, uh -huh. if you assume that there is some true proposition, uh -huh. like 2 is equal to 2 or right. something, then there exists a true proposition. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get into the loop that this is self-grounded. Mm, a sort of a truth teller situation where you you yes. you don't know, but if you fix it, you're fine. Yes, and but I don't know, but you but still if, if right? one of the things in the loop uh -huh. is grounded itself, the things in the circle also become all determined. Yeah, determined. Yes. Um, so. I believe that these kind of cases are seem like paradoxes, mm. but if you well, yeah. if you buy that there can be self-reference, like if you, which is usually assumed in, in, in theories theories of truth, yes, yes. Um, like you can do Kripian accent analysis anal analysis for example, yes, 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 yes. and then you can determine you can determine perfectly true values. Uh, for these parad seemingly paradoxical cases. So you can then set up grounding rules that determine these true values, even though obviously there are self-reference, so there, yeah, there yeah, are cycles. Yeah. So I think you, the, the argument against uh, uh, full grounding is perfectly acceptable that you gave. If you also accept as a dogma anti-symmetry, I would like to challenge yeah, no, 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 anti-symmetry, and then I was wondering whether your argument still holds for you, if you think it's well, still... Well, I mean, if, uh, no, if you remove anti-symmetry, clearly it doesn't, I mean, then it's, it's all right. I, I would say that if you have in mind grounding in a, in a Kripke sense, sure, like truth determination in the sense of uh, having that truth is determined, Mm -hmm. But if if you essentially want to capture a notion of clarification or right displaying reasons, then the loop is a problem because then you you say well just because because a why because b why because a I mean yeah if you but that seems to be a problem but if there is a way into there the reason gets I mean. A is a reason for B and B is a reason for A, but C is also a reason for A and therefore also of B. And this can then grant other stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean it's it, 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 it's circular, but it's not viciously circular. No, in um, the sense of uh, having truth, which is determined, I, I see absolutely is not right. If you think about clarifying in in a more epistemic sense, I would say it is a problem because I mean. So, I don't know. Well, it could be, yeah. So, it, it clarifies an aspect, but not everything. But, uh, yeah, I mean, but it only. You have a weaker notion of. Yeah, no, for the deterministic, uh, for, so for the complete one, you have. This is not possible, of course. Uh, um, but but for, full, for, for, for full grounding, it seems that you can always have multiple ways in which it's grounded. Yeah, right, right. And then you can have an entrance that is not circular into a circle, into a cycle. And, and then you just, yeah, you can essentially just... And, and that still that says something about yeah. clarification. No, 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 I see it. Yes, yes. Um, but I see that your way are But I agree that, uh, that essentially fine. I'm just uh, saying I want anti-symmetry. It's not an argument in favor. It's just uh, yes, 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 essentially yes. Yeah, requiring it by, by choice. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very interesting. Well found. Thanks for that.
a very short question. Yes. So you said at the, at the very end, the future work and what has been mm -hmm. already completed. I was wondering, I'm very interested in this connection between learning and the rules of a calculus. Mm -hmm. Is it completed? Yes. I was wondering if it's published or it's something that... Sorry? Uh, if it's something that you have already published or... Uh, I... Yes, so okay. first part of the work, yes. Okay. So essentially the, the normalization part. Essentially I just published. Okay. Five days ago or something. It's <laughs> 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 really nice. It is really nice. <laughs> <laughs> So essentially there I study, I just uh, remove the introduction rules and use grounding rules instead. Mm -hmm. So grounding and elimination rules. And I prove the normalization of the calculus. Okay. And then in another paper, because otherwise it was too long, they told me, <laughs> uh, there is also the, the analysis of what that means with respect to uh, classical logic and intuitionistic logic. So what kind of uh, try to see what's the real difference between logical rules and grounding rules. That's not, not yet published, submitted only. But yeah, if you're interested, uh, I can also send you the other one. Okay. Four minutes, but we can also stop. Okay, well, in that case, thank you very much. Thank you.